Welcome to our third session. Um, we're looking at the parallel passages of Colossians 3 and Ephesians 4, and we're learning together Jesus' incredible promises for our hearts and lives. We're being rescued. We're being reshaped by Jesus' forgiveness, grace, and power. Last session, we talked about um, Paul's appeal to us according to the authority of Jesus and he says that we can just stop lying and just stop letting anger control us and let the power of God guide and direct our lives. Just stop, Paul says. We've talked about how our sinful behavior is like splashing paint all over people and how our anger and our meanness and our selfishness gouges the hearts and the lives of people around us. We're learning that God doesn't leave us stuck in that loop of cruelty, but instead provides promises and power to let him guide our lives. In this session, we're learning that we not only do not have to splash our paint and our pain on people, but we have an opportunity through God's gracious and incredible power to actually clean up some paint, to restore relationships, and to do good to others, not through fierce personal determination or sheer force of will, but instead through the powerful presence of God working in us, providing his desire and his power. Paul continues on this just stop uh, parade of promises in Ephesians 4.28. Paul says, if you are a thief, quit stealing. Just quit. I, I said that at the very top of this introduction. Can you just quit evil behavior? Well, according to Paul, yes, because Jesus, who always does what pleases God, has sealed you and sealed me in his powerful promise. You see, right before you do the evil thing, you don't. And instead, you follow Jesus into the throne room of grace and receive help in the time that you need it most. That's a promise from Hebrews 4.16. It says that Jesus is a good and faithful friend in this respect. He serves like a high priest and we can go to him in our time of greatest need. So if your greatest need is to just stop doing evil behavior, well, Jesus is there for that. That's exactly what he's made available to us in the promise of his presence. Instead, Paul writes, if you're a thief, quit stealing. Instead, Paul says, use your hands for good, hard work, and then give generously to others in need. Would you look at that two-for-one trade that God's work in me would produce? Again, I've said it over and over again. Philippians 2.13 says, God is working in me, giving me the desire and the power to do what pleases him. But look at the very practical terms that Paul's promise from God provides us. God works in me, so I will let him empower me to quit stealing. And then God brings more good things into my life than the bad thing he takes out. He says he will use my hands for good, hard work. And he changes my mind to be generous instead of being a selfish thief. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. So you see how God's promises are so amazing to fulfill that? Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Now I am free from the crime of stealing and the meanness of selfishness that motivates me to steal. And now I'm free to do good to do good hard work, and to do the good thing that is giving. God multiplies his character qualities in me by making room for his ways in me. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is truly freedom. See, before when I'm stealing, all I had was an expectation of judgment and being caught and constantly covering up my life. But now, look, and Paul says in Galatians chapter 5, there's no law against the good things that God produces in us. That's the thing, isn't it? There's no fear when the deputy's car rolls by. If I'm a thief, I'm living in fear constantly. I'm always waiting for the other shoe to drop. And scripture puts it this way. I live under a fearful expectation of judgment. But now, according to the promise of Jesus Christ, not only do I not have the fearful expectation of judgment from stealing but I'm doing generous things. I'm doing things against which there is no law. I truly have freedom because the Spirit of the Lord is in me. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. 
Paul continues in Ephesians 4.29. He says, don't use foul or abusive language. Let everything you say be good and helpful so that your words will be an encouragement to those who hear them. So this is even more than just cursing someone out. Of course, we're not supposed to just walk around cursing people out. This also goes to show how we motivate or manipulate by our words. You see, no longer do I have to use foul or abusive language to control you. I don't have to make you feel bad about yourself to make myself seem taller or better, smarter or stronger, or have influence over you. Instead, God has replaced my foul or abusive language, my manipulative speech, to give me words from God that reveal to you that you are made in the image of God. Man, I tell you what, in these times under quarantine, I'm surprised at how quickly our culture went along with declaring ourselves non-essential. That's something that's very striking to me. I'm not essential. I just do this. I just do that. I do the other thing. If I stayed in my house for the rest of my short, miserable life, no one would ever notice. And I understand that people are trying to prefer and defer to one another's health and well-being, but you're not non-essential. You've never been non-essential. You see, you bear the image of God. He made you, and you are a work of art to him. You have never been non-essential. You have strength that is a God-given gift, and we need to be reminded of his words and his works of love for us. Christ's love for us says that we are anything but non-essential. Our culture loves to motivate by shame, by regret, by embarrassment, by remorse. You should feel terrible. Your ideas are bad and you should feel bad. <laughs> but God, through Jesus, speaks his words of love, belonging, and acceptance to us. Jesus loves us into repentance and into his kingdom. He doesn't shame us into relationship with him. He loves us. Ephesians 4.30 says, do not bring sorrow to God's Holy Spirit by the way you live. Remember, he has identified you as his own, guaranteeing that you will be saved on the day of redemption. Here's where we come to the biggest point of practical living for the big word that I, a big three letter word that I like to talk about in all of the theological books. They seem to always skip over this one, let. This is the biggest place. Do not bring sorrow to God's Holy Spirit by the way you live. Remember, he has identified you as his own, guaranteeing that you will be saved on the day of redemption. This reminds us of God's word uh, through Paul in Galatians chapter 5, where he says, let the Holy Spirit guide your life. Here, he gives us the opposite, the negative side of it. Don't bring sorrow to God's Holy Spirit by the way you live. If we pair it together from the promises in Galatians chapter 5, we would say, instead, let the Holy Spirit guide your life. I've said it so many times, and you might be tired of hearing it, but let is the biggest theological word in all of the New Testament, certainly the biggest three-letter word. It fully realizes the completed work of Christ for us. We won't embrace letting something rule our lives if it doesn't work. If there's a floppy jalopy in your driveway, a bad car with two flat tires, a huge oil leak, no windows, and smoke pouring out of the exhaust, and I say, let me take you on a drive, you'd want to know exactly how we can get anywhere in that floppy jalopy oil pouring out of it, smoke out of every crack and crevice on the vehicle, no windshields, two flat tires. You're like, I can't let you take me anywhere because I can't see how you can get anybody anywhere in that vehicle. But when I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your life, the Holy Spirit is perfect. The Holy Spirit is powerful. The Holy Spirit is part of God's community. God the Father, Jesus the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is full and welcoming. Welcoming. The Holy Spirit is perfectly placed and perfect for you and for me. There is no way you can miss the guarantee that you will be saved on the day of redemption. That is a vehicle, that is a method, that is a mode, that is a manner, that is a power filling your life that is guaranteeing you to get from here to God's presence. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 31 says, 
Get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, harsh words, and slander, as well as all types of evil behavior. Instead, in place of that, be kind to each other, be tender-hearted, forgiving one another, just as God, through Christ, has forgiven you. Get rid of all and let. Do you see that? Get rid of all these things and let. God, once again, gives us an amazing exchange. Get rid of this painful practice in your life and be filled instead with the powerful promises of Christ. Be done with this culture of cruelty and instead be embraced, be loved, be belonging together because you belong to Jesus. Get rid of all these and let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Let Jesus rule in your hearts. Let the peace of Christ control the things you do. Do you see how these are all related? We must understand from all the repeated promises and their unfolded context text that this is never an admonition to just be better, just be stronger. Do you see that? At every single point, Paul has instructed us repeatedly to, reply, to rely fully on Jesus Christ. What we see here is Paul telling us to fully rely on Christ and not utilize anything from the toolbox we used to use and we see utilized all the time. Bitterness, rage, Anger, harsh words, slander, and behavior, they work really, really well in our society and culture, don't they? They're constant motivators. They're constant inhibitors of behavior. Think about how you've been motivated throughout your life. I want to think through the list of bosses that you've had. Maybe you've had nothing but good bosses, but most of us have had bosses that weren't great people. Think about how many bosses that you have had that got your best effort by all of their kindness, by all of their tenderheartedness, by all of their forgiveness, and by being Christ-like. How many bosses have you had like that? On the other hand, how many bosses have you had that you were just straight up afraid of? You needed that paycheck and you would put up with their rage, their anger, their harsh words, their slander, and their evil behavior. How many of you have broken laws and rules in your work because you were afraid of the outcome? That's evil behavior. And yet we were motivated not by the Christ-like behavior of our boss, but by fear. And see, Jesus doesn't motivate us with fear, does he? It is his love, it is his kindness that leads us to repentance. But those things, bitterness, rage, anger, harsh words, slander, evil behavior, they really work well. They get you elected to high and powerful positions. They get you promoted in this world. Not so in the kingdom of Jesus Christ. Paul is showing us that to get rid of all of these things is done exclusively through Christ. It isn't just a thing that naturally happens. We are made aware of the life Christ has provided for us, and we are changed in our dependence on the ways that we've always got things done to instead trusting in and letting the finished work of Christ replace our ways. It is the life Christ lived, and we put, a, put away, we, we put behind us our old ways and live in the newness that Christ provides. The light of Christ dispelling our darkness the mind of Christ replacing our understanding and the power of Christ glorified by the setting aside of my brokenness for his glory and his triumph. The forgiveness of Christ is a constant, consistent, irreplaceable foundation for my soul, and it is the fuel for my being. I am, through Christ, always enabled and empowered to forgive. And I am not bound to being a contemptible creature who mindlessly consumes and abuses the forgiveness of others, Christ included. In his newness, his life has been given to me so that I can let him be the ruler of my heart. I can let the word of Christ dwell in me richly. I can let the Holy Spirit guide my whole life. The Word of God is living and active, not passive and permissive, to have me be a consumer only of God's grace and mercy, but instead to be an instrument of Jesus' grace and mercy. Thank you for joining me in this three-part mini-study. Remember, this is your promise from God, and you can say it 
And you can pray it with full confidence, knowing how much Jesus loves you and how important it is for your heart and your soul to thrive on God's pleasure for you. Philippians 2.13 says this, and I want you to make it personal when you read it, when you think it, when you say it, when you pray it. God is working in me, giving me the desire and the power to do what pleases him. You are not non-essential to the kingdom of God. You are loved by God. You belong to Jesus Christ. You are accepted by him and you are approved of by him. You have his love, you have his belonging, and you have acceptance. And he is working in you to give you the desire and the power to do what pleases him. Because doing what pleases him is essential to your soul and your being. I pray God's grace and peace and hope and joy are yours this week as you enjoy belonging in Jesus Christ. Join us next time on our live stream or one of our other studies available online. Thanks for being with us.